Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Next Level Human Podcast. Uh, we've been off the topic of metabolism for a couple weeks, and so we're going to jump right back into it with what I regard as probably uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, tool sets or understandings that we all should have or need to have around eating, and that is uh, the concept of convenience eating. The fact of the matter is most of us, when you think about our busy lives, um, we eat uh, an awful lot of meals out of boxes, packages, restaurants, fast food joints, and that kind of thing. Not everyone uh, cooks, and certainly almost everyone does not cook every single meal. And so if you're going to be successful long term with health, fitness, fat loss, a sustainable lifestyle, you're really going to need to understand how to eat and maneuver around convenience based foods and eating out and those kinds of things. And so that's what we're going to cover um, in this podcast. Now, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, some of you may have heard this story before if you've been following me a while, but most of you will not have. But um, many of you might remember years back, uh, there was a documentary called um, the, uh, what, the, what was that documentary called? It was the one where they basically had McDonald's um, Supersize me is what this was called. It was basically where this guy goes and he um, decides he's going to eat McDonald's for a month straight and documents all his meals and does pre and post lab work. And obviously, you can imagine what happens. He gets fat and unhealthy. Well, one of the things that bothered me back then about that particular documentary was this idea that. If you know how to eat appropriately, then you can't necessarily blame it on the fast food place like McDonald's, right? So obviously, the people who did this, uh, I think it was Morgan Morgan Spurlock and his wife, who was a vegan, there was some obvious bias there. And by the way, it was a good thing on the one hand because it did bring attention to the problem of processed foods, but it also did not cover the opportunity of processed foods. And you might say, well, Jade, what do you mean by that? Well, one of the things that we have to understand is that if most people are going to be eating all or most of their meals in a convenience pattern. And I'm not talking about, you know, the whole food shopper and the people who, you know, are fanatical about food. I'm just talking about your average everyday Westerner who's just trying to feed their family, do their job, take care of everything they have to take care of in the world, and also try to eat healthily and on a budget. Well, one of the things I did after watching that particular show is I said, you know what, I could do the same kind of thing um, by essentially eating a month's worth of fast food, but eating it according to specific rules. And I bet you I can lose weight and actually get healthier. And so I set out to do that. And just like there were rules in the movie or documentary um, Super Size Me, I had some rules as well that I built around this. So in Super Size Me, they had a rule of, hey, you had to eat everything on the menu. And um, 
there they had to eat what three meals per day and i think you had to finish whatever you bought or whatever it was right so i had a whole other set of rules and i'll walk you through those rules really quickly because what i decided and i did do this i decided to do pre and post blood work i decided to do 30 days of eating at mcdonald's only and um, I documented uh, everything that I did in terms of my weight loss, my blood labs and vitals and all of that kind of thing. But instead of doing it the way they did it on Supersize Me, I did it uh, an entirely other way. And I'm going to teach you that method here right off the bat. And a lot of you know that I, I teach according to acronyms. And so this acronym goes by the acronym Fast Food. Right, so it goes by the acronym fast food, and this basically documents the rules that I used to do this challenge and the way that I would suggest that you do this as well. And I'm going to go through all of these really quickly, and then I can go into sort of the details here. But the first one of fast food, the acronym is the F, and the F first F stands for fat. And so the idea here was always choose to eat foods high in fat versus high uh, versus foods high in starch or sugar in other words the whole point of this is that it's far better to eat eggs and bacon than hot cakes and sugary oatmeal in a sense and so this was the first piece now neither of those are ideal but we're talking about convenience-based food here so the first f is fat now the first a in this acronym of fast food stands for avoid this is an important one, and it is based on some science that I'll share with you, but the idea was to avoid the combination of anything that was high fat and starch slash sugar at the same time. So this means French fries were out, breaded chicken was out, burgers with the buns on were out, milkshakes were out, or any other food that combined a fat and a starch was off limits and not allowed for me in this fast food diet that I was eating. So first, choose fat over starch and sugar. Second, avoid fat and starch sugar combinations. The next one was S for salad. A salad was mandatory with every single meal that I ate except breakfast. Obviously, that's difficult to do with breakfast. And the salad should not include any starchy foods. So no croutons, no wontons, anything like that. Um, it could include lean and or fatty protein like chicken breast, fish, pork, or steak. And it had to include only vinegar-based dressings like balsamic vinaigrette and non-creamy Italian dressings. And I defined a salad as any meal containing salad and other veggies, but no starch. So these types of salad could include things like burger with extra vegetables, burgers without the buns, you know, a, a burger salad, burrito bowls without the starchy rice or beans, stir fries without the rice, etc. Now, of course, my um, rule was mainly around uh, McDonald's, but I'm also giving you the rules that you would want to follow if you did this. The first T is taste. You were only allowed, or I was only allowed, a taste of starch, no more than three big bites or five small bites of starchy or sweet foods were allowed per day. Now, given the high amount of fat and high sodium content of convenience meals, it is best to avoid starch sugar uh, combinations. And because insulin, the major promoter of insulin, is going to be starch slash sugar. And that is going to also make us retain both water. One of the things a lot of people don't know is that glycogen, our form of sugar storage or starch storage in our liver, and in our muscle pulls water with it. Uh, glycogen is a lot like a sponge. So a gram of glycogen is gonna pull in about three grams of water with it. And it also makes you retain sodium when you're insulin resistant. So part of this idea was if we're gonna have very high calorie foods in the form of fat, uh, we wanted to minimize any other sort of negative influence. You do not want a high calorie diet with a high insulin, insulin producing diet. So that was part of it. So that's the fast part. 
F fat, A avoid, S salad, T taste. Now the food part is the first F is fruit. So the idea here was real whole and unsweetened fruit should be eaten whenever possible every morning for breakfast. Part of the reason for this is that when you are dealing with convenience based foods and restaurants and things like that, um, you could pretty much get a salad anywhere except for breakfast. And a lot of people don't really like eating salads uh, for breakfast. So the idea here was whole fruit should be something that we, uh, for the nutrition benefit and also for the fiber and water content, would be something to focus on for breakfast. Now, the O in food is only only drink water, unsweet tea, unsweet coffee, zero calorie life waters or vitamin waters and things like that. And no other beverages were allowed uh, other than uh, all anything without uh, calories. I actually avoided diet sodas as well, fruit juices, alcohol, coffee desserts, anything like that. Although I have done this with numerous, not numerous, probably thousands of people who have included diet sodas just fine and been, uh, you know, no worse for it. Now, the second O here in the food acronym is one. One free meal every week. So every week, eat as much as you like of whatever you like within a two-hour time period. This one is a tricky one, and we'll get into it in just a minute, but this is what I did in my challenge. And then the last D of this acronym fast food was do. Do some exercise every day. So to get the most out of any eating program and to make sure the weight you lose uh, is going to be mostly fat and not muscle, you want to be doing some type of exercise, uh, preferably um, you know, some type of weight training. And in this particular uh, challenge that I did, I limited myself to three weight training sessions per week because I did not want to go crazy with exercise. And so fast food acronym is the best way I have found to teach people how to eat a convenience based diet. Now you might say, well, okay, Jade, what happened on this program that you designed for yourself eating 30 days at McDonald's? Well, in 30 days, I lost uh, roughly around eight or so pounds. Uh, most of that was fat, but most importantly, when you looked at my blood labs, my blood sugar readings went down, my hemoglobin A1C went down a little bit, not a ton, because hemoglobin A1C is best measured every three months, not every month, it moves very slowly. But my insulin levels dropped, my fasting blood sugar dropped, my cholesterol levels, my triglycerides, everything improved. Now, I know this is not as simple as saying, hey, eat everything on the menu and see what happens. But what it showed conclusively for me and what it should demonstrate for you is that you can eat a convenience-based diet. And if you know some of the rules that I'm going to teach you in this podcast, you should be able to not just get results, but actually get healthier. And I'll tell you another story here before we get deep into this about a, a, one of my very first clients that really helped me understand the importance of individuality, personal preferences, and people's practical circumstances. You know, I often talk in this podcast about the idea that we are each unique. We are unique in our physiology, our psychology, our personal preferences, and our practical circumstances. I call these the four Ps of the law of metabolic individuality. If we're going to design a lifestyle that we can learn to live with, love, and stay on, we need to account for our unique physiological reactions, our unique psychology, and most particularly our personal preferences and practical circumstances. So one of my first forays into this was a gentleman by the name of Dale. I'm changing his name, um, but a past patient of mine, one of my earliest clients actually. I was only a few years out of naturopathic medical school. He was sent to me by his wife, who was also a client of mine. And Dale was, uh, for lack of a better term, a good old boy. He was, you know, a good old Southern boy, long haul truck driver, who basically ate wherever his truck stopped and was sitting for long, long hours of every day. You can imagine driving around in a truck. His wife sent him to me because he had just been diagnosed with diabetes. He was about 30 pounds overweight or more. Um, 
He had just been put on metformin by his uh, physician. He came to me and he kind of admitted right off the bat. He was like, look, I don't believe in all this, you know, woo woo, new age nutrition stuff. I'm here because my wife was here and he was kind of annoyed. Now, I knew I wasn't going to be able to take this guy from, you know, a truck driving couch potato fast food eating person to someone who was living off of salads and collard greens and kale and lean cuts of meat and organic foods and things like that. I had to come up with something he could do. Now, one of the things that I understand and know and that you should understand and know about anyone with diabetes or anyone that's dealing with blood sugar related issues, one of the things that happens to them is they first lose the ability to, um, deal with burning their fuels effectively. In other words, their metabolism becomes less flexible and more rigid, and they cannot use up the blood sugar that they're getting from their diet, and they cannot use up the blood fats that they're getting from their diet. So one of the first things that you'll see in these individuals is you'll see uh, blood sugar, fasting blood sugar go up on their blood labs, and you also see a high fasting triglyceride level. Um, it's important for people to know that fats travel around the blood as triglycerides. So basically, the glycerol molecule is water soluble, but the fat molecules are not. And so in order for the body to shuttle fat around in the bloodstream, it does so with triglycerides. A triglyceride is a glycerol molecule that has three fatty acids attached to it, which allows it to be soluble in water. So while we measure blood sugar, we don't measure blood fats directly because we couldn't measure those fats. We measure triglycerides. We measure this glycerol with these fatty acids. So whenever you're looking at your blood labs, you can see how well you're burning sugar by the fasting blood sugar. You can see how well you're burning fat by the triglyceride level. And so he was diabetic. He had high fasting triglycerides, high fasting blood sugars. He was on metformin. His doctor was threatening to put him on insulin if he did not get things under control. And he was coming to see me. Now, I knew I could not just move him to, you know, the standard whole foods diet of, you know, people like, frankly, a lot, you and me and a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are health you know, health food freaks. I knew I had to work with where he ate. Well, where did he eat? He ate at Exxon Mobil's gas stations. He ate at McDonald's. He ate at Greasy Spoons. He ate wherever his truck was stopped. He ate out of vending machines. Now, one of the things that you should know that I'll teach you right now about diabetes is that because he has lost the ability to burn sugar, partly because his insulin levels are so high and he's suffering, suffering from insulin resistance, one one of the things you want to do, the first move you want to do is remove starch slash sugar from the diet. And this includes even healthy starches, things like sweet potatoes and regular potatoes and, you know, sometimes fruits and things like that. You want to take these things out. And as a result of this dysfunction in being able to burn starch and sugar, you have to ramp up the fat intake and the protein intake a little bit. Now, protein is like a flex fuel, so protein can be made into glucose fairly quickly in some people. So even in some diabetics, you reduce even their protein intake. This was not the case with Dale. But as I was talking to Dale, I essentially knew right away I was not going to be able to address this issue with him of you know, um, changing his diet completely. So what I said was, I was like, look, we need to get you off the starch slash sugar. So we're not going to change where you eat, but when you go to Exxon Mobil gas stations and things like that, I want you to switch out the candy bars for things like protein bars. I want you to switch out the potato chips and uh, Doritos and things like that for nuts and seeds and those kinds of things. I want you to, you know, get Slim Jims or beef jerkies and things like that. I also want you to trade in the Coca-Colas for Diet Coke or better yet, water and things like that, which he was a Coke drinker uh, and uh, did not really, you know, even, I remember him telling me, I don't like the taste of water. So we moved him away from sugars and more towards fatty, protein-rich foods and into, you know, sort of what I considered at the time poisons. I don't today, but then I did diet sodas and things like that. I never could imagine putting someone on a diet soda. 
But this was the thing. And one of the things I asked him was, I was like, can you do this? And he goes, you know, it's strange, but yeah, I can do that. I also had him, taught him how to peel off the buns off of his um, burgers and sandwiches and things like that. Tried to get him to make burger salads. I said, order whatever you want. Just understand this rule that fat is better than sugar and you want to avoid fat and sugar combinations and you want to create salads wherever you go, right? You want to basically create a burger salad or if you're at a Mexican place, create a uh, burrito bowl without any of the starch. And if you're gonna eat this kind of stuff, you want to not put starch and sugar in. Okay, it's Dr. JT here just breaking in real quickly. It is time to talk about one of our sponsors, our earliest sponsor, Cured Nutrition. This is a CBD company. Cured Nutrition is another one of those next level human companies that is doing amazing things in the world. Let me tell you a little bit about one of the things I've been doing with CBD here recently. There is some really interesting research showing that chronic cannabis users, these are people who are smoking marijuana, are actually down-regulating the cannabinoid 1 receptor. Well, guess what the cannabinoid 1 receptor is involved in? Well, it's involved in cravings and hunger. And there is some really interesting mouse research that shows mice given products that lower CB1 or being engineered with a lower CB1 activity actually eat less and are not obese as a result of that. And so I have been experimenting using CBD to lower hunger, to down-regulate the CB1 receptor, just the way chronic cannabis users tend to be very thin. And it has been working very well. Now, of course, the other thing that I use this for and have used it for, for since day one is uh, Cure Nutrition has a product called Zen that is a mix of magnesium and CBD and some other really nice formulations in there that I use to help me sleep. I have notoriously bad sleep. My sleep still is not perfect, but the Cure Nutrition product Zen has made a big difference to helping me sleep better. And that is just huge. Now, of course, they have other products. They also have a product called Rise, which I do not use, but I have used in the past. It is great for those people who like to have a pick-me-up in the morning to focus better. So Zen and Rise are fantastic, but any of their CBD products used for down-regulation of the CB1 receptor to help with hunger and cravings, if you're one of these people who is constantly overeating and on a diet you find that, hey, when I'm on a diet, I get this crazy sort of hunger and cravings, this may be something you want to check out. So check out CuredNutrition.com. Use the code next level. I get a kickback to help us have these discussions on the show. It's a great way for me to be able to do this work. So thank you for Cured Nutrition for that. Of course, Cured Nutrition gets the sale and you get to work with a fantastic company that gets results with their supplements. I hope you will check them out. CuredNutrition.com. Use the code next level. I wanted to take a second to cover one of our sponsors and tell you all about Paleo Valley at PaleoValley.com. These are the grass-fed sticks that I tell you all so much about that all of my friends know I have on hand constantly. They are in my car. They are at my house. I keep them at my sister's home and my parents' house. I have these things everywhere because they are the simplest, most convenient whole foods protein supplement you can get, almost like carrying around pure protein, low-carb protein in your pocket. They also, these Paleo Valley beef sticks, are the only, the only 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef sticks on the market. They use organic spices. They are naturally fermented instead of using nitrates and nitrites that can be a problem in some of these cured meats. And they simply taste fantastic. Check out the original or the jalapeno. Those are my favorites. Please make sure you go over to paleovalley.com and visit. When checking out, use the code next level for a 15% discount. Remember, our sponsors keep the show going by you giving them your patronage and spending your money on these high quality products. You actually do a few things. One, you're helping to support the podcast. And two, you are helping your health. And three, you are making sure that good 
quality companies like Paleo Valley can be out there doing their business, changing the world, making the earth better. One of the things you may not know about this is that grass-fed organic and grass-finished beef is doing something that is so utterly important for our environment, actually helping to repopulate the topsoil. A lot of people don't know this, but our topsoil is being extremely depleted and raising animals especially cattle the correct way helps to get that topsoil back this is one of the reasons why i love paleo valley not to mention it tastes fantastic but they're one of these companies like my other sponsors cured nutrition and organifi that are doing the right things by the environment i really appreciate everything they do and i hope you will check them out thanks so much paleovalley.com use the code next level and now back to the show so he uh, agreed that he could do this, which is really all I wanted to hear. Now, in truth, I didn't think I was ever going to see this guy again. But three months later, he comes back. I barely recognize him. He's lost 30 pounds um, or more. He is all, his doctor uh, took him off his metformin. Now, the interesting thing about this, I was in North Carolina at the time, so I was not his physician. I was just a consulting uh, clinician. Um, his doctor took him off his metformin, and he had amazing results, essentially not doing anything. He was eating at all the same places, and I basically taught him this fast food acronym in how to eat. This is absolutely critical. Now, why am I bringing this up? Partly because I'll, I'll tell you a little secret and a little pet peeve of mine about the health and fitness industry. It's to me a rich person industry in a sense. It assumes that everyone's personal preferences are for health food, that everyone can uh, uh, afford health food, and that everyone, um, it assumes that all foods are created equal, meaning that, you know, it assumes that if you eat one food, like eating a salad is going to fill you up in the same way a burger does. And it simply is not the case. And so we have to meet people where they are. And so this fast food method came out of working with people like Dale. And he was one of the first people to show me the power of um, going against what my common bias would tell me. You know, who would have thought by moving someone off of uh, soda, one poison, I thought, to another poison, diet soda, and having them eat all this fatty food without the starch and sugar and teaching him to eat and behave this way that he would get such amazing results. Now, what's interesting about that is I remember that uh, after that, he asked me at that point, what else can I do? Now, isn't that interesting? Someone had, didn't want anything to do with natural medicine or changing in nutrition. Once he saw the power of what these slight changes can do, he was far more likely at that point to want to explore things further. And this is the power of this. And so when you're thinking about convenience-based eating, you want to understand these rules. So let's go through them one by one again with this fast food acronym, and then we'll get into um, reading labels and a few other things, and then we can end this podcast. Now, the fat part, you might say, well, Jade, what's the deal? Isn't fat highest in calories. Now, for most of you, this is not going to be a confusing discussion because, you know, blogs, podcasts, every popular place you look, books, etc., has talked about this idea of fat being better than sugar and starch. Now, let me be clear. Fat is not better than sugar and starch. Neither is sugar and starch better than fat. It simply is what works for people and what does not work for people. Ultimately, what we need to do is we need to create a diet that is low calorie, hungry, hunger suppressing, nutrient dense, and satisfying enough, tasty enough, but not so tasty that it makes you overeat. Now, fat is always going to be better for somebody who is a starch or sugar fiend and especially a diabetic. Now, also, fat is much easier to find in fast food places than, um, you know, low, low fat, high starch items. And that's ultimately what we want to look at when we look at this first little bit here. The, the fast food acronym, the first F is fat. The second uh, letter there, the A is avoid. You want to focus on fat ultimately because you want to avoid the combination of high fat, 
and starch slash sugar at the same time. Now there's two ways you could go about this. One, you could take out the fat and go very high starch and high fiber starches and have a very low fat, high carb diet. That would actually do a lot of the same thing. Research actually hints at this. People who move from mixed macronutrients, you know, the standard American diet to either like a keto-based diet where it's high fat, low carb, or um, a vegan or vegetarian-based diet where it's high carb, low fat, both seem to be able to naturally and accidentally cut calories down as a result of this. Because let's face it, the biggest calorie bomb you can have is going to be one that combines fat and starch slash sugar. So yes, there are some nuances here, but in general, when we're talking about a place like McDonald's or a fast food place, fat is going to be far easier to find, at least fat and protein combinations. And what's interesting is fat and protein combinations are very, very hunger suppressing. And so that's one of the reasons why burgers and pizzas and all these things are so hunger suppressing. They can still be just as hunger suppressing without as many calories when you remove one component, in this case, the starch. So in this method that I'm teaching you, you want to focus on either high fat, very low carb, or high carb, very low fat. You want to avoid the combinations of fat and sugar slash starch. And the other piece here is that we know now pretty conclusively, and there's actually a popular layperson's book out there called The Hungry Brain, written by Stephen Guiané, um, PhD out of, I think he's out of Washington State University, or um, University of Washington in Seattle, actually, um, that talks an awful lot about how the combinations of fat, sugar, starch, and salt can hijack the appetite centers in the brain and make us overeat. And so part of the reason that these sort of uh, you know, single flavor diets like the keto diet might be working is because they avoid this combination. Same thing with the vegan based diets. So yes, focus on fat first, avoid this fat sugar combination. And then the S here is salad. Now one of the key things if you're gonna learn to eat a convenience based diet is you want to understand how to make a convenience salad. I oftentimes talk about the idea of soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries. Now, when you think about soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries, then, and, and we're talking about low carb soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries, well, a soup is just a wet salad. A scramble is basically an egg salad. It's basically eggs with vegetables, right? A salad is a salad. And then a stir fry or skillet meal is a hot salad. And then a uh, shake, protein shake, oftentimes is a blended, you know, um, you know, sort of protein salad. People can put vegetables in there or even fruits and things in there as well. And so these, this is just another way of talking about salad. Salads in this convenience way of eating need to become the dominant thing that you do. However, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you're doing soup, salad, scramble shakes, and stir fries, or salads, you can make these salads. There's several rules you can do with these salads. You can make these salads with fatty things. You just don't want to put a lot of starch on them because you want to avoid that combination. And also, when we're talking about salads, the best thing you can do to keep the calories down is to move to vinegar-based dressings. Italian dressings, balsamic vinaigrettes are the best. Now you might say, why? Well, vinegar, just like lemon juice and other things, uh, bland foods are the same ways. One of the things we think, these things can suppress our appetite. Part of what a sour or bitter or vinegary kind of flavor does to us is it is an ancient uh, sort of mechanism to tell us our food may not be um, good that may have gone bad. Now this obviously is not the case with fermented foods, but these things can suppress appetite. So when you add a vinegar based dressing, not only are, will those have less calories than the creamy based dressings, they also can have some potent hunger suppressing effects on individuals. Now you also will notice in this fast food acronym that the, the first T in the FAST is taste. It does mean you can have a taste of starch. In my case, if you want really good results, you want to limit those tastes, three to big bites or false, three big bites or five small bites of starchy sweet foods allowed per day, right? 
on this. So that's per day over all meals. So you want to kind of save those up. So you can tell this is a very low carbohydrate diet and a very hunger suppressing diet because it's got lots of vegetables that have a lot of fiber and water, plenty of fruit, which has water and a fiber in it and lots and lots of protein slash fat, which is very hunger suppressing. Now with the fruit piece, a lot of people bring this up. When you want to think about just hunger suppression, you want to think protein, fiber, and water. Now a lot of people think that fruit is going to make you fat. And I oftentimes use this funny little saying that a lot of people laugh at, but I'm like, fruit only makes you fat if you are eating it after free basing chili cheese fries and junk food all week. Fruit in itself is highly nutritious, loaded with water, and you're not going to be able to overeat fruit. Think about it this way. Can you eat a big bag of pretzels or potato chips or something like that in one sitting? You absolutely can. Could you eat five apples in one sitting? No, you could not. Now, of course, if you take those apples and make them applesauce, you can eat more. And if you take those app that applesauce and make it apple juice, you can eat even more. But when we're talking about whole fruits, the water in these things and the fiber in these things are highly hunger suppressing. Not to mention these are one of the most nutrient dense foods you can have. So yes, fruit is very important. No one's going to get fat off of eating fruit and you're far more likely to have lots of hunger suppression because of the water and the fiber in fruit. Now, the only part here, the only drink water, unsweet tea, unsweet coffee, zero calorie beverages. This is critically important. Now, I'm not a fan because I have a natural bias against diet sodas and things like that. However, I can tell you that the research shows that these things can be beneficial for weight loss. Now, what's interesting about this research, if you look at correlations, um, you will find that lots of diet sodas are correlated with obesity. And so a lot of people think that means that they cause obesity. They do not. It's just that obese people are more likely to use a low calorie beverages because they're saving on calories. Now, there is some indication that these things can disrupt the microbiome and that these things can make some people more hungry. But when you look at randomized control trials where they take people and say, we're going to give you a low calorie diet beverage to drink instead of your normal sort of diet, what ends up happening is these individuals usually lose weight. This saves on calories. Now, if you can stand it, I would say use something like Zevia or a more natural diet soda or skip diet sodas altogether and go for water, unsweet tea, unsweet coffee, zero calorie life waters, vitamin waters, things like that. But the point is drink plenty of non-calorie beverages, mostly water. Now, this whole idea of one free meal every week, this is an option and it's a tricky thing because remember what I talked about Stephen Guillenet's work and the hungry brain. Sometimes a cheat meal can turn into a cheat week or a cheat month. Part of that issue is the combination, once again, of fat, starch, sugar, alcohol, and salt. And so if you are going to have one of these cheat meals, reward meals, or free meals, be very careful when you are doing this. And then of course you need to do some exercise. Now this fast food acronym that we're working off of here is a really useful one if you're someone who really wants to, it finds themselves through whatever circumstances, either through preferences or circumstances, that you are going to be eating lots and lots of foods in the convenience category. Follow this fast food acronym and you will be able to at least not gain weight and perhaps lose weight doing this. Now in practice, these rules are really for those of us who eat uh, convenience foods on occasion and not always, but they're very, very important. And so this is a really good way, a very practical way and a clinically proven way, cl proven in my clinic over thousands of people and in my online programs with tens of thousands of people to be highly effective for people who eat convenience driven foods. So this is how you want to be thinking about eating out and convenience based eating. Now let's cover real quick. I've actually done a podcast on this very early on in the life of this podcast on boxed foods 
and convenience foods. How can we address these things and figure out what is best to eat? Once again, the rules I'm operating from here are the idea that we want a hunger suppressing diet, a calorie sparse diet, a nutrient dense diet, and a diet that does not hijack the centers in the brain that control appetite and cravings because it's too palatable or too hedonistic. And so when we're looking at foods in boxes, we can go and look and see, well, we just learned throughout, or you learned just through this podcast that protein, fiber, and water are the least amount of calories. They are the most hunger suppressing and foods that are loaded with protein, fiber, and water are typically the most nutrient dense. Think about protein, fiber, and water-based foods. This is going to be lean steak, lean fish, lean chicken, all all non-starchy vegetables, all fruits. This is essentially a very paleolithic type of diet, an extremely nutrient-rich diet. And so when we're looking at looking at labels, we can essentially go, all right, well, if I know protein, fiber, and water is lower calorie, nutrient dense, and hunger suppressing, then I want to look at things on the label that will help me with protein, fiber, and water. Well, if you look at any label, you'll see dietary fiber spelled out, and you'll see the protein level spelled out. Now, the other thing we understand or understood from this particular podcast is that the combination of fat and um, sugar or starch is highly calorie, uh, you know, um, it, it gives you a ton of calories. It may not be as nutrient dense and it can cause you to overeat in general. So when you're looking at this idea of what should I be looking at on a label, what you can do is you can take the protein concentration on the label and the dietary fiber concentration on the label and compare that to the total carbohydrates and the fat on the label, right? This is really important. Now, when you're talking dietary fiber also, and you're looking at labels, you want to add sugar alcohols to that. For example, let's say you have a product that has 10 grams of carbohydrate. And when you look under the carbohydrate, you see dietary fiber is five grams and you see sugar alcohols are three grams. Well, that's eight grams of non-digestible carbohydrate because sugar alcohols are not digestible and nor is fiber. And so you would go, okay, well, both the sugar alcohols and the fiber should count as fiber. And then you're going to take that and add it to the protein. And then what you want is you want that protein plus fiber to preferably exceed the carbohydrates plus the fat. But you definitely want them within 10 of each other. And so I'll give you an example here. Let's say you have a food that is has 3 grams of fat, 6 grams of total uh, total carbohydrate, three grams of fiber, and three grams of protein. Well, if I take the three grams of protein and add it to the three grams of fiber, that gives me six grams. Now, if I add the, the total carbohydrate, six grams, to the total fat, three grams, I get nine grams there. That's nine versus six. That's within 10. This is gonna be a relatively hunger suppressing food because of the fiber and the protein and is not excessive in uh, you know protein and fat and you also want to by the way look you know next at sort of the serving size here a little bit as well um, so that you know you don't have this teeny tiny serving size because we're doing this for one serving and this can help you in a general way begin to see okay I want foods where the protein and fiber preferably exceed the fat and the total carbohydrate. This is a really useful way to be looking at this. Now, you also could say, for example, you might say, well, Jade, what about just plain old air popped popcorn? This is very high in carbs. There's no fat. There's no protein in it. Um, what about that? Well, this also is something to consider here because when you think about this, if you're gonna be going the vegetarian vegan route, which is the whole point of this, it's gonna be difficult for vegans and vegetarians to find lots of processed foods that are going to have protein and fiber exceed fat and carbs. And so in that case, what you wanna do is you want to look at the carbohydrates relative to the calories. And so what you really want in that case is you want more carbohydrates and fiber 
without a whole lot of fat and calories. And this will help you uh, sort of manage this. And so convenience eating is absolutely critical here. And I'm hoping that this little, uh, you know, teaching a tool of the fast food acronym will allow you to manage eating out at restaurants and also this idea of being able to read labels is going to help you at the grocery store when you're picking things up and also choosing things to snack on always go for protein fiber and water first try your best to avoid combinations of fat and starch if you have to choose fat or starch, it's far better to do fat and protein combinations than uh, carbohydrate and protein combinations simply because fat and protein is far more satisfying for most people and far more satiating for most people compared to protein and carbs. So it's about a hunger suppressing effect here. You want to focus on all the different variations of salads more than anything else. Soups, salads, scrambles, shakes, stir fries, skillet meals, the sheet pan meals, these kinds of things. Things that are basically some combination of a lean protein with lots and lots of vegetables. This is what you want to be focusing on. You want to control some of the other elements here. Don't go adding tons of calories in the form of vinegar or dressings and things like that. Stick with vinegars and things like that first. This should, I hope, give you the you know sort of crash course in how to eat out at fast food joints or restaurants or choose boxed foods when you are managing convenience around nutrition. I hope this episode helped you. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out on the podcast and I will see you at the next episode.